So in patients that have failed all their medication treatments for epilepsy, some of them come to us and they have spots that we can see the seizures coming from and we treat them surgically and some of them have unfortunately spots that we can't find or alternatively, it seems like they have several different spots that are causing the epilepsy. The one device that has just, uh, that has been in study for a long time and approved has been deep, deep brain stimulation uh, for epilepsy. Now the, the interesting thing that I tell patients about this particular device is that this isn't going to make you seizure free. So there are patients that have seizure free periods with them uh, and some of them quite impressively. Uh, they still have some seizures. But uh, what I tell them is that uh, the way medications work is that when we give them medications it either makes electricity in their brain go really fast or really slow. And based on that, that's what affects the seizures. So it's a lot like medica medications except that it has risk with upfront implantation. So the other catch-22 that I tell patients all the time is that medications, if you take them for 10, 20 years, what happens is their risk profile uh, worsens with time. There's more side effects as you take something chronically. The part that actually goes in the brain is super small. So in the past, we've, we've only implanted pa patients that have failed another type of stimulator called the VNS. This, the FDA approval kind of changes that. There's definitely going to be people that we suspect have temporal lobe seizures, but we don't know where they are, or potentially they're in areas that are dangerous to remove that are probably going to be very good candidates. Uh, um, other focal epilepsies, there's, their seizures have some characteristic that we think they start in one spot, but we've tried and tried and can't find where that is, or we don't have very good evidence to suggest where that is. This may be a very good therapy for those patients. When a resective surgery is, is not an option, or alternatively, we found a spot that we could remove, but we think it's going to cause a lot of problems, this really applies to patients in that kind of bucket of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, epilepsy, right? The therapy is reversible. So if, uh, if the patient doesn't like having the device because it's a foreign device, we've been implanting um, this even before FDA approval uh, because we believe in the therapy. We believe it's very helpful and we're also a very experienced DBS center. Um, we've also continued to experiment with other targets. Uh, as well, and uh, this will help facilitate that. But I think ultimately it's the quality of patient care here and the teams and the experience that, that is here. I think once it becomes apparent that you're not going to be able to get achieve seizure freedom with medications, that that's a great time for referral to not only be evaluated for this therapy, but any therapy that could treat the seizure completely. I think our center is very successful like a, lot, a couple of other handful of epilepsy centers out there because we invested an awful lot of time as a team talking about patients. Now the interesting part about epilepsy is that epilepsy is actually a lot of guesses and at least epilepsy surgery is a lot of guesses in, in testing that and the testing has to do with how we, where we put electrodes and, and it turns out that the only um, person that's right on these guesses is the one where we see where the epilepsy focus is coming from. So the more minds involved give us more theories, more ideas, and, and more ability to test because if we can find that spot we're going to be more successful. So um, interestingly enough, I don't, I don't believe there's an actual electrode implant at this institution that occurs without at least one surgeon, so oftentimes two, and multiple, uh, four or five uh, epileptologists looking and approving the plan, which I think is very unique to this institution.